Take yourself back ages ago, 10 years, nay, 20 years, nay, we can go further, 30 years, <laughs> you're not even trying, come on, 50 years, nay, 100 years, that's more like it. A difficult question to ponder for you, was there fire 100 years ago? The really clever among you will say yes there was, and you'd be right. Well let me pose another question. If fire existed 100 years ago, did houses? Again yes. Did they ever combine, you know, fire plus house? Again yes. A gold star for those on 100%. In other words, two out of two right. Let me ask you yet another question. How did people around 100 years ago get in contact with the emergency services? And yes, the emergency services did exist then. No, people didn't live in caves for anyone born after 1990, or anyone on 0%, 0 of 2. But that's fine. My goal here is to edutain, so keep watching. Let me put some facts your way. Sit comfortably. Phones have been around in the UK from around 1879, but their ownership was reserved for the very privileged. And sometimes phones were co-owned in groups of houses or even streets by those less able to afford one on their own. But when the phone was invented, was the 999 call invented at the same time? The answer? No. Did you ever consider what things were like before the invention of the 999 number? Well, we're going to answer some of these questions and we're going to go a bit further. We're going to let you know how it was the 999 number was invented and when. And actually, let's start with another fact. For around 30 years, it was possible for the public to call the fire brigade without using a telephone. Back in the late 1800s, there were things called fire alarm posts, and these were strategically placed around towns, mounted on posts, and typically near factories due to their higher fire risk. You guessed it, each alarm post, when polled, would send its unique number to the fire station using a direct line. An alarm would sound in the fire station, and the firefighting crew would know from that transmission which alarm post had been activated. Although the brigade wouldn't know the exact location of the fire, when they got to the fire alarm post, they'd usually be able to find it without too much trouble by, you know, following the kind of big smoke, flames, that kind of thing. They were professionals. You can actually see the location of these posts on old OS maps. They're down as FAP points or FAP points. Yeah, FAP points. That is what I said. There were thousands of these posts placed across the UK, as you can imagine, particularly in busy cities. So members of the public could use these posts in order to report a fire. But they weren't without their problem. As I've already said, they couldn't transmit precise information about a particular fire. And on top of that, the naughty British public would occasionally use these to transmit calls for a prank. Uh, we call these malicious calls. And sometimes electrical faults would also transmit a signal as if there were a fire and the fire brigade wouldn't know that these were signals due to electrical defects until they got to the location. So when the telephone was first sort of widespread in the UK, the 999 number didn't exist. But those lucky enough to own a telephone could dial zero, get through to the operator, and then ask the operator to put them through to the emergency services. People that owned a telephone back then were known as telephone subscribers. And one such subscriber, who's key to this story, lived on a street called Wimpole Street in London. And on the night of the 10th of November 1935 at 6.40am, he and his wife noticed a fire at number 27 Wimpole Street. And putting their telephone to good use, they dialed zero. But they weren't connected to the Welbeck Exchange straight away and they got cut off. In fact, it took them several minutes to get through to the Welbeck Exchange. And meanwhile, the fire continued to rage at number 27 Wimpole Street. However, luckily, the fire brigade were alerted by a member of the public using one of the FAP posts or fire alarm posts. And so a fire pump truck did reach the location that night, but unfortunately quite late. The brave firemen fought the fire, and yes, they were men in those days, fought the fire, but unfortunately five women lost their lives in that burning building. The fireman on duty that night, a man by the name of Leonard Tobias, was commended by the coroner for his bravery. Long after his men had collapsed, Tobias continued to fight the fire single-handedly. He was, by all accounts, a hero. However, unfortunately, he went on to lose his life just five years later in World War II, when a bomb landed on his head. Actually, I'm not sure if it landed on his head specifically, but I think you know what I mean. So back to our telephone subscriber in Wimpole Street. Absolutely furious that he couldn't get through, he wrote a letter to the Times, the Times newspaper. And in his letter, he outlined his disappointment with not being able to get through to the Welbeck Exchange in time. This issue was then picked up by the UK government and inquiry ensued. The post office at the time ran the telephone network across the UK. 
and it was someone in the post office that came up with the bright idea that a number should be used that could be easily memorized by the public, that could be easily dialed in an emergency and would get through to the post office exchange. And at the exchange, these calls would have priority over just normal calls. Something that was game changing at the time was that when these emergency calls came in, an alarm signal and a flashing light would sound at the post office switch rooms. But this wasn't without its problems initially, as reported in the post office telecommunications journal, which said, When the raucous buzzer sounded in the quiet, disciplined switch rooms, a few of the girls found the situation too much, and they had to be carried out of the room due to shock. This problem was solved when engineers stuffed tennis balls into the mouths of the klaxons, reducing the volume of the alarms. So how did the 999 number come about? Well, someone in the post office suggested that a number should be used that can be easily found by touch in, say, a smoke-filled room or a dark room. So it was suggested that an end number should be used. An end number meaning one that was on the end of the telephone dial at the time. 111 was rejected because that could be triggered by faulty equipment. 222 would have connected to the Abbey. 000 couldn't be used as the first zero would have dialed the operator. So 999 was deemed a sensible choice. Not everyone was thrilled with this idea. In the House of Commons, Sir Sidney Herbert, Conservative politician, quipped, How will a lady with a burglar in her house even remember to dial 999? However, putting Sir Sidney's chauvinist concerns to one side, 999 was introduced and initially covered a 12 mile radius around Oxford Circus in London. With its introduction, a notice in the evening news advised the public on how to use it, which stated Only dial 999 if the matter is urgent. For instance, the man in the flat next door to yours is murdering his wife. Or you've seen a heavily masked cat burglar peering round the stack pipe of the local bank building. Somewhat surprisingly, the service would only become UK wide in 1976. 40 years after its inception, and this came about with the arrival of automatic exchanges in all parts of the country. In 2019, there were around 33 million 999 calls made, but unfortunately, the British public are no less naughty than they were back in the day, with only around 25% of those representing genuine emergencies. Shame on us. <laughs>